Hello there and welcome to this Beyond Shakespeare exploring session of part two of The Witch of Edmonton, a spooky play that um, so far hasn't been that spooky. Uh, we, it did take a supernatural turn uh, yesterday, uh, just towards the end of the session, uh, but it's also um, a very interesting play about uh, uh, society and um, and uh, the hierarchy and uh, and the way um, society works, especially towards women. Uh, continuing on today, uh, we're going to start from uh, Act Two, Scene Two, and helping me uh, do that is this wonderful team of readers. Uh, reading Third Clown, Sir Arthur, and Third Countryman is. Hello, I'm Eric. Eric, and I cannot summarize anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading Susan, Spirit, and Old Banks is. Hello, I'm Lois, looking forward to this in London. Reading Carter, Sawgut, and Mother Sawyer is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Romford. Reading Second Clown, Winifred, and Constable is. Oh, hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor based in Montpellier, France. Reading Warbeck and Second Countryman is... Hello, I'm Lynn. I'm a college composition teacher living in the Northwestern United States. Reading Summerton, Dog and Justice is... Cold. Steve Longstaff, a retired academic, wondering whether I should be outside building my ark. <laughs> Yes. Uh, reading Cuddy today is... Rachel, actor on the East Coast. Reading Frank and Hamlet is... Bryony Sparrow, actor in Lincolnshire. And reading First Clown, Old Thorny and th First Countryman is... Hi, I'm Greg and I'm a renegade from the evenings. Oh, turn up to... Grace is with your presence in the afternoons. Uh, and I am your host, Sarah Blake, uh, stepping in temporarily for our regular Master of Revels, Rob Crichton, who will be back tomorrow. So, as I said, we're going to pick this up from Act 2, Scene 2. And we enter, we have entering Carter, Warbeck and Summerton. How now, gentlemen? Cloudy? I know, Master Warbeck, you are in a fog about my daughter's marriage. And can you blame me, sir? Nor you me justly. Wedding and hanging are tied up both in a proverb, and destiny is the juggler that unties the knot. My hope is you are reserved to a richer fortune than my poor daughter. However, your promise <clears throat> is a kind of debt, I confess it. Which honest men would pay. Yet, some gentlemen break in that point now, and then, by your leave, sir. Confess thou hast had a little wrong in the wench, but patience is the only salve to cure it. Since Thorny has won the wench, he has most reason to wear her. Love in this kind admits no reason to wear her. Then love's a fool, and what wise men will take exception? Come, frolic, Ned. Were every man master of his own fortune, fate might pick straws and destiny go wool-gathering. You hold yours in a string, though, tis well. But if there be any equity, look thou to meet the like usage ere long. In my love to her sister Catherine, indeed they are a pair of arrows drawn out of one quiver, should fly at even length. If she do run after her sister. Look for the same mercy at my hands as I have received at thine. She'll keep a surer compass. I have too strong a confidence to mistrust her. And that confidence is a wind that has blown many a married man ashore at Cuckold's Haven, I can tell you. I wish yours more prosperous, <laughs> though. Whatever you wish, your wish, I'll master my promise to him, as you did to me. No more of that. If you love me, 
but for the more assurance, the next offered occasion shall consummate the marriage, and that once sealed... I'll leave the manager of the rest to my care. But see, the bridegroom and bride come. New pair of Sheffield knives fitted both to one sheaf. The sheaf might have been better fitted if somebody had their due, but... No harsh language, if thou lovest me. Frank Thorny has done... No more than I, or thou, or any man. Things so standing would have attempted. Enter Frank Thorny and Susan. Good morrow, Master Bridegroom. Come, give thee joy, mayst thou live long and happy in thy fair choice. I thank you, gentlemen. Kind Master Warbeck, I find you loving. Thorny, that creature, much good do thee with her. Virtue and beauty hold a fair mixture in her. She's rich, no doubt, in both. Yet were she fairer, thou art right worthy of her. Love her, Thorny, tis nobleness in thee and her in her, but duty. The match is fair and equal, the success I leave to censure. Farewell, Mistress Bride, till now elected, thy old scorn deride. And Warbeck exits. Good Master Thorny. Nay. You shall not part till you see the barrels run a tilt, gentlemen. And Carter exits with Somerton. Why change you your face, sweetheart? Who I? For nothing. Uh, dear, say not so. A spirit of your constancy cannot endure this change for nothing. I have observed strange variations in you. In me? In you, sir. Uh, awake, you seem to dream... And in your sleep you utter sudden and distracted accents, like one at enmity with peace. Dear loving husband, if I may dare to challenge any interest in you, give me the reason fully. You may trust my breast as safely as your own. With what? You half amaze me. Prithee. I come, you shall not. Indeed, you shall not shut me from partaking the least dislike that grieves you. I'm all yours. And I all thine. You are not, if you keep the least grief from me. Uh, but I find the cause. It grew from me. From you? Uh, from some distaste in me or my behaviour. You're not kind in the concealment. Alas, sir, I am young, silly, and plain. More strange to these contents a wife should offer. Say, but in what I fail, I'll study satisfaction. Come, in nothing. I know I do. Knew I as well in what you should not long be sullen. Prithee, love, if I've been immodest or too bold, speak in, in a frown. If peevishly too nice, show it in a smile. Thy liking is the glass by which I'll habit my behaviour. Wherefore dost weep now? <laughs> you, sweet, have the power to make me passionate as an April day. Now smile, then weep, now pale, then crimson red. You are the powerful moon of my blood's sea, to make it ebb or flow into my face as your looks change. Change thy conceit, I prithee. Thou art all perfection. Diana herself swells in thy thoughts and moderates thy beauty. Within thy left eye, amorous Cupid sits, feathering love shafts, whose golden heads he dipped in thy chaste breast. In the other lies blushing Adonis, scarfed in modesties and still as wanton Cupid blows love fires. Adonis quenches out unchaste desires. And from these two, I briefly do imply a perfect emblem of thy modesty. Then, prithee, dear, maintain no more dispute, for when thou speak'st, it is, it, it's fit all tongues be mute. Come, come, these golden strings of flattery shall not tie up my speech, sir. I must know the ground of your disturbance. Then look here, for here, here is the fen in which this Hydra of discontent grows rank. Heaven shield it, where? 
in mine own bosom. Here the cause has root. The poisoned leeches twist about my heart and will, I hope, confound me. You speak riddles. Take it plainly, then. T'was told me by a woman, known and approved in palmistry, I should have two wives. Two wives, sir, I take it exceeding likely, uh, but let not conceit hurt you. You're afraid to bury me? No, no, my Winifred. How say you, Winifred? You forget me. No, I forget myself. Susan. In what? Talking of wives, I pretended Winifred, a maid that at my mother's waited on me before thyself. I hope, sir, she may live to take my place, but why should all this move you? Poor girl. She has before thee, and that's the fiend torments me. Yet why should this raise mutiny within you? Such presages prove often false, or... Say it should be true. That I should have another wife? Ah, uh, yes, many. If they be good, the better. Never any equal to thee in goodness. Oh, sir, I could wish I were much better for you. Yet, if I knew your fate ordained you for another, I could wish, so well I love you and your hopeful pleasure, me in my grave and my poor virtues added to my successor. Prithee, prithee, talk not of deaths or graves. Thou art so rare a goodness as death would rather put itself to death than murder thee. But we, as all things else, are mutable and changing. Yet you still move in your first sphere of discontent. Sweet, chase these clouds of sorrow and shine clearly on me. At my return, I will. Return? Ah, me. Will you then leave me? For a time I must. But how, as birds their young, or loving bees their hives, to fetch home richer dainties? Leave me. Now has my fear met its effect. You shall not. Cost it my life, you shall not. Why? Your reason? Like to the lapwing, have you all this while with your false love deluded me, pretending counterfeit senses for your discontent, and now at last it is by chance stole from you. What? What by chance? Your, your pre-appointed meeting of single combat with young Warwick. Ha! Huh. Even so, dissemble not, tis too apparent. Then, in his look, I read it. Deny it not, I see it apparent. I cost it my undoing, and unto that my life I will not leave you. Not until when? Until he and you be friends. <laughs> Was this your cunning? And then flam me off with an old witch, two wives, and Winifred. <laughs> you are not so kind indeed as I imagined. And you are more fond by far than I expected. It is a virtue that attends thy kind. But of our business within, and by this kiss I'll anger thee no more. Troth, Chuck, I will not. You shall have no just cause. Dear Sue, I shall not. And the scene ends. Oh, Frank. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Um, yes, who wants to comment on that then, Rachel? Um, a, a, a more a vocabulary question. Um, fond, the way fond is being used here is not in the same way that we would use it today, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Lois, do you yeah. want to answer that? Yeah. yeah I mean, it 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 mean, it does mean fond, but it does have the implication of slightly stupid as well. I mean, fond, you know, to excess, or, uh, and you can speak of someone as being fond when they're simply being rather dumb. Hmm. Yeah. She does genuinely seem to love him, though. Mm, which you know, <laughs> poor girl. I mean. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if he was actually going to go through with the uh, with the 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 second marriage and actually become a bigamist, but no, it it seems he has. Um, the dads are really happy. Um, they've gone off to get drunk at the wedding reception, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and 
this it's kind of heartbreaking this thing that um you know he says oh i've got to leave you now presumably because he's going off to meet winifred and she's she's just convinced that oh no you're gonna go and fight a duel with my ex suitor with the up with my with your rival over me and uh, it's just really really heartbreaking um yeah anyone else got any thoughts on that scene what it's doing uh how wh how it's furthering the uh, the plot, what we, how it's changing the characters. Lynn, did I see a hand there? No, yeah, it's just the, just as you say, it's just, it's so painful to watch that Susan is convinced. Oh, it must be my fault. I, mm. I mean, she's a little bit of a twit, um, but um, but you have to feel really, really bad for her. She just wants her marriage to work, mm. and she's just crazy about this Frank fellow. He must be really handsome or something. I don't know. Well, um, I think he he has wooed her as well. I mean, we we, we yeah. were told that yesterday. He has gone out of his way to make her think that he's in love with her. So yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, me oh my oh, Eric. Yeah, for a second there, I thought she was on to him. Like, and it's interesting how this, yeah. this play keeps you sort of guessing yeah. um and yeah it's kind of like oh yeah no you, you can't go do whatever you you think you're gonna go off and do and then you're like oh, does she know does she know and you kind of want her to know yeah um but yeah yeah and it's it's yes because there's that thing that moment where he calls her winifred and you think oh, it's all oh, gonna come it. out and then it doesn't and that makes it worse in a way you you feel even more for her so like yes these are playwrights who know their business in terms of uh, how to twist the hearts of their audience uh right well, uh, rachel is that a hand i see yeah i was gonna say um a little that a little of that magic from uh mother sawyer's scenes kind of comes in here when there's this talk of palmistry mm -hmm. we kind of get it's like it's like that creeping that anticipation that that um uh you know mother sawyer the mother sawyer scenes created kind of creeps into this uh a little bit yes it's that using of, of superstition isn't it to sort of where he's using it i guess to pave the way uh so that when and if she finds out later on that she's yeah, that he's a bigamist, basically. He's sort of laid the groundwork, but then the conversation takes a turn. It's very, very interesting. Uh, right, well, okay, let's find out what happens next. That was the end of yeah. Act Two. Oh, Lynn, is that a hand that I see before? Quick point of order. Yeah. Um, the, the clown is the countryman, right? First clown is first yeah. countryman, second, yeah. okay. I, I figured. Uh, cool. No, the countrymen are separate characters and they come in later. Okay. The clowns are countrymen. Um, yeah, but we actually have countrymen later on in the text as separate people. So basically, whatever you've been assigned for, for clown oh. and countrymen, to, to, uh, you know, Rob's assigned the parts like individually. So it's not, if you've been marked as a countryman, but not as a clown, it means you're not reading a clown. I think oh, that's oh, okay. right. Uh, Cool. Is is it? Let me just check. Yes, no, he's 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 cast the clown separately to the countryman. So uh, yes, just oh. just uh, stick with your uh, the the titles you've been given. So we go into Act Three, Scene One, and enter Cuddy Banks with the Morris dancers. Nay, Cuddy, prithee, do not leave us now. If we part all this night, we shall not meet before day. I prithee, Banks, let's keep together now. If you were wise, a word would serve. But as you are, I must be forced to tell you again. I have a little private business, an hour's work. It may prove but in half hours, as luck may serve. And then I take horse and along with you. Have we e'er a witch in the moors? No, no, no woman's part but Maid Marian and the hobby horse. I'll have a witch. I love a witch. Faith, witches themselves are so common nowadays that the counterfeit will not be regarded. They say we have three or four in Edmonton besides Mother Sawyer. <laughs> I wish she would dance her part with us. Oh, would not I, for if she comes, the devil and all comes along with her. Well, I'll have a witch. 
I have loved a witch ever since I played at Cherry Pit. Leave me and get my horse dressed. Give him oats, but water him not till I come. Whither do we foot it first? To Sir Arthur Clarington's first, then whither thou wilt. Well, I am content, but we must up to Carter's, the rich yeoman. I must be seen on hobby horse there. Oh, I smell him now. Oh, lay my ears, Banks is in love. And that's the reason he would walk <laughs> melancholy by himself. Ha! Who was that said I was in love? Not I. Not I. Go to. No more of that. When I understand what you speak, I know what you say. Believe that. Well, not I. I'll not deny it. I meant no hurt in it. I have seen you walk up to Carters of Tresham. Thanks. Were you not there last Shrove time? Yes, I was ten days together there, the last Shrove tide. How could that be when there are but seven days in the week? For the peace, I reckon still an Oba as a traveller. Thou understandest as a fresh water farmer that never sawest a week beyond sea. Ask any soldier that ever received his pay but in the low countries, and he'll tell thee there are eight days in the week there hard by. How dost thou think they rise in high Germany, Italy, and those remoter places? I, but simply there are but seven days in the week yet. No, simply as thou understandest. For thee look but in the lover's almanac, when he has been but three days absent, but three days absent, oh, says he, I have not seen my love these seven years. There's a long cut. When he comes to her again and embraces her, oh, says he, now methinks I am in heaven, and that's a step. He that can get up to heaven in ten days need not repent his journey. He may ride a hundred days in a carroche and be further off than when you set forth. But I pray you, good Morris mates, now leave me. I will be with you by midnight. Well, since he will be alone, we'll back again and trouble him no more. But remember, but remember Banks. Banks. The hobby horse shall be remembered, but hark you. Get Paul Davis, the barber's boy, for the witch, because he can show his art better than another. Excellent all but cuddy. Well, now to my walk. I am near the place where I should meet, I know not what. Say I meet a thief. I must follow him, if to the gallows. Say I meet a horse, or hare, or hound. Still I must follow. Some slow-paced beast, I hope. Yet love is full of lightness in the heaviest lovers. Ha! My guide has come. Enter the dog. A water dog! I am thy first man, Sculler. I go with thee. Fly no other but myself. Away with the boat. Land me but at Catherine's dock, my sweet Catherine's dock, and I'll be a fair to thee. That way? Nay, which way thou wilt? Thou knowest the way better than I. Fine gentle cur it is, and well brought up, I warrant him. We go a ducking, spaniel. Thou shalt fetch me the ducks, pretty kind rascal. Enter a spirit visarded. He throws off his mask, etc., and appears in the shape of Catherine. Thus throw I off mine own essential horror and take the shape of a sweet, lovely maid whom this fool dotes on. We can meet his folly, but from his virtues must be runaways. <laughs> we'll sport with him, but when we reckoning call, we know where to receive. The witch pays for all. The dog barks. Aye, is that the watchword? She's come. He sees the spirit. Well, if ever we be married, it shall be at a barking church in memory of thee. Now come behind, kind Kerr. And have I met thee, sweet Kate? I will teach thee to walk so late. Oh, see, we meet in meter. The spirit retires as he advances. What? 
dost thou trip for me? Oh, that I were upon my hobby horse, I would mount after thee so nimble. Stay, nymph, stay, nymph, sing Apollo. Tarry and kiss me, sweet nymph, stay. Tarry and kiss me, sweet. We will to Chesham Street, and then to the house stands in the highway. Nay, by your leave, I must embrace you. And he exits following the spirit. And Cuddy, that's you again. Oh, help, help, I am drowned, I am drowned. Re-enter Cuddy, wet. <laughs> this was an ill night to go a wooing in. I find it now in Pond's Almanac. Thinking to land at Catherine's dock, I was almost at Gravesend. I'll never go to a wench in the dog days again, yet tis cool enough. Had you never a paw in this dog trick? A mange, take that black hide of yours. I'll throw you in at Lime House in some tanner's pit or other. <laughs> How now? Who's that laughs at me? Hissed to him. The dog barks. <coughs> peace, peace. Thou didst but thy kind neither. Twas my own fault. Take heed. Now thou trustest the devil another time. How now? Who's that speaks? I hope you have not your reading tongue about you. Yes, I can speak. The devil you can. You have read Aesop's fables then. I have played one of your parts then, the dog that catched at the shadow in the water. Pray you, let me chastise you a little. What might one call your name, dog? My dame calls me Tom. Tis well, and she may call me ass. So that's, so there's an old one betwixt us, Tom ass. She said I should follow you in tea. Well, Tom, give me thy fist. We are friends. You shall be mine ingle. <laughs> I love you, but I pray you, let's have no more of these tucking devices. Now, if you love me, Dogs love where they are beloved. Cherish me, and I'll do anything for thee. Well, you shall have jowls and livers. I have butchers to my friends that shall bestow them, and I will keep crusts and bones for you, if you'll be a kind dog, Tom. Anything. I'll help thee to thy love. Wilt thou? That promise shall cost me a brown loaf, though I steal it out of my father's cupboard. You'll eat stolen goods, Tom, will you not? Ooh, best of all, the sweetest bits, those. You shall not starve. <clears throat> Ningle Tom, believe that. If you love fish, I'll help you to maids and souls. I'm acquainted with a fishmonger. Maids and souls, ooh, sweet. Beats. Banqueting stuff, those. One thing I would request you, Ningle, as you have played the knavish cur with me a little, that you would mingle amongst our Morris dancers in the morning. You can dance. <laughs> mm, yes, yes, anything. I'll be there, but unseen to any but thyself. Get thee gone before. I fear not my presence. I have work tonight. I serve more masters and more dames than one. He can serve the devil. He can serve mammon and the devil too. It shall concern thee and thy love's purchase. There is a gallant rival loves the maid and is like to have her. <laughs> Mark, what a mischief before the Morris ends shall light on him. Oh, sweet Ningle, thy nuff once again. Friends must part for a time. Farewell. With this remembrance, shalt have bread too when we meet again. 
if there if ever there were an honest devil twill be the devil of edmonton i see farewell tom i prithee dog me as soon as thou canst and cuddy exits i'll not miss thee and be merry with thee those that are joys tonight must take delight in sins and mischiefs tis the devil's right and the dog exits and the scene ends. So that was quite an interesting turn of events. We started off with the clowns coming back again, still preparing for their their Morris dancing. Um, Cuddy's turning into quite a good part, isn't he? I was just thinking that as 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 I was reading that, you know, in the in the hands of the right actor who can get the most out of all those those sort of like puns there's a lot of punning isn't there and yeah. it, like it could just be like oh my god no he's at it with the puns again but you can imagine that in the hands of the right actor that could actually be um that could turn into quite a, a fun part and then the dog reappears and is it just me who or does he seem not as creepy and as threatening um in this scene he he's not it's <laughs> nothing to do with actually to be to be fair, your voice was a lot more creepy and threatening than Eric's was yesterday because Eric was doing Scooby Doo <laughs> to, 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 to quite a, quite astounding effect. Uh, but I mean, he just it seems to me that he doesn't. I mean, yes, he's still talking, but he doesn't seem to have the same aura of menace around him that he had yesterday when we met him uh, with Mother Sawyer. Uh, Lois, what do you think? Yeah, um, yeah I think it's uh, it's partly the the cutty scenes generally are lighter. I mean, I felt myself that Mother Sawyer also changed yesterday when she was talking to Cuddy and sort of setting him up for what mm. happened in this scene. Uh, so I, I think it's partly that, that uh, uh, I think the person writing the cutty scenes may be different from the person writing the, uh, the kind of earlier Mother Sawyer scene. Mm. I mean, who knows? But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what I, I was laughing all through this. I mean, it, it's partly just Cuddy's matter of fact way of dealing with a talking dog. Oh, you yeah. can talk, right. Yeah. Uh, you can dance, oh good, you can be an armorous. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because I'm, I'm sure there's some vague recollection of uh, The Two Noble Kinsmen, which is a part Fletcher play uh, in which uh, the, this mad girl is co-opted to be in the Morris dance. You know, I mean, there's this idea that the Morris dance is so crazy that you can sort of include all sorts of things in it. So just as they, they discover a mad woman wandering around and get her to dance. So here he wants the dog in the Morris dance and uh, uh, and he would like to get the witch in the Morris dance. It's kind of the same idea, I think. Mm, it's, it's almost the idea that the evil kind of glances off him because he's not aware of it, because he can't, yeah. because he doesn't yeah. feel it and see it. You know, obviously Sawyer does because she's she's been the, the victim of it, uh, but he, he it just kind of glances off him because he has this kind of innocent yeah. quality to him. Um, any other thoughts about this? No? Oh, Rachel, yes. And then Lynn. My interpretation, um, I don't know, was maybe it's because the relationship is like you guys are kind of saying or my perception is, is that um, he's got more of like a, it seems like he's forming more of a partnership, uh, more the, like there's something more equal about them um, that he calls them, you know, that is that by a close friend or something that isn't the same, you know, when he, how he says Ningle and somebody just told me in the chat that that means close friend. It, it's not the same sort of scene setup that we had last time between uh, Mother Sawyer and the dog where it's like this covenant in the blood and it seems mm. some, it's something like, um, uh, you know, it's the reverse of holy, it's an unholy sort of matrimony type thing. And here he's created a different relationship. He's a friend, he's an accomplice. Mm. He's gonna um, help him el eliminate a rival. And it kind of is like um, the last scene we just had with um, Warbeck. Um, and Susan talking about, oh, so you're going to go fight him in a duel. You know, the, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where, you know, that last scene is going to lead or may, maybe it's setting us up for some other sort of parallel or some other sort of business like this. 
Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because yes, he's the dog has just said, "Oh yeah, I can do stuff for you." That there hasn't been any mention of like, "Oh well, you need to, you know, yeah, sign a contract with me, and I need to lap your blood." I mean, he, he, Gunny hasn't had to go through any of that that uh, that Sawyer had to go through yesterday. So it's definitely a different dynamic. Um, Lynn, you had your hand up, and then I'll come back to Lois. Yeah, there is this sort of buddy. Mm. Uh, ethic going here, give me your fist, shake my hand. And thy knee, once again, you know, we're, they're shaking hands. So, <laughs> yeah. But I, I was just going to point out that we have a very tenuous tie to the other plot. Um, the dog talks about uh, there's a, a rival for, mm. there is a gallant rival loves the maid and likely is to have her. So we're talking about Summerton, Summer, Summerton, or whatever his name is, um, who is also in love with Kate, mm. who is the sister of Susan, who is Frank's second wife. So, yeah, um, it, it, it's feeling a little contrived, but we'll see how those how that works out. Yes, Cuddy is the only point of contact between the two plot strands at yeah. the moment. Uh, we'll see if that changes as we go through. Lois, did you have something else that you wanted to add? Well, the the last uh, lines of the of the scene from the dog, I think are kind of explaining <laughs> that, uh, you know, this is going to be light comedy and this is, he's kind of justifying the fact that it is so different from his uh, previous appearance with Mother Sawyer. I mean, he says those that are joys denied must take delight in sins and mischiefs, you know, he's going to, and he's going to be merry with him. So, you know, he, he, can, he feels he can be comic because even in a kind of nasty way, he's going to be playing tricks on people and so on. He's not going to be doing anything good. Uh, but, he, but he is justifying his part in the comic part of the play. Mm, yeah. Yes, the fact that he can be different things to different people. And actually carrying on from what Lynn said yesterday about whether there's a psychological read of this play. I mean, yes, it, it, it's, it's that thing of perhaps that, Going back to what I was saying about Cuddy being an innocent, like maybe the dog, the dog's <clears throat> personality is affected, or you could certainly stage it this way uh, and play with the theme of the fact that the dog is affected by the personality and the experience of the person that he's dealing with. So Sawyer, because she's only ever received hatred uh, and, and, and been ostracized, uh, the dog becomes a far more dark figure for her. Um, because I don't know, he becomes like a reflection of her inner inner urges. Maybe I don't know. I I, I have no idea whether this um, this idea of, of the whole thing being like a, a, a you know a psychological manifestation is going to work or not. But I really liked that idea yesterday. So I'm seeing how far we can take it. <laughs> right, uh, Stephen. <clears throat> On the other hand, the dog gets really, really excited about the bits of offcuts from the butchers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When he's with Cuddy, he's far more like a normal dog. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's because maybe Cuddy is treating him like a normal dog. Well, like, and yeah, and just accepts the fact that he could talk. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, talking dog. Excellent. I like Let's the go. idea of an easily distracted demon that took the wrong <laughs> shape, you know. It's kind yeah. of like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like... Just, just tickle it under the ears and it'll forget. Yeah. Oh, livers. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was going to say that that sort of psychological, like the dog um, being sort of uh, a manifestation of the psychology of each person actually works because he does kind of go, those that are joys denied must take the light and sins and mischiefs to the devil's right. And basically that's what Cuddy delights in that's what like sort of because he can't he, he's basically reflecting every person he meets yeah he's a mirror to them yeah anyway. we'll, we'll see if that plays out as we as we continue on right well if no one else has anything to say let us move on into act three scene two uh, we have enter frank thorny and this time winifred his first wife who is dressed in boys clothes Prithee, no more. Those tears give nourishment to weeds and briars in me, which shortly will o'ergrow and top my head. My shame will sit and cover all that can be seen of me. I have not shown this cheek in company. 
pardon me now, thus singled with yourself, it calls a thousand sorrows round about, some going before and some on either side, but infinite behind, all chained together. Your second adulterous marriage leads, that is the sad eclipse, the effects must follow, as plagues of shame, a spite, scorn, and obloquy. Why hast thou not left one hour's patience to add to all the rest? One hour bears us beyond the reach of all these enemies. Are we not are we not now set forward in the flight, provided with the dowry of my sin to keep us in some other nation? While we together are, we are at home in any place. Tis far ill-gotten coin, far worse than usury or extortion. Let my father then make the restitution, who forced me to take the bribe. It is his gift and patrimony to me, so I receive it. He would not bless nor look a father on me until I satisfied his angry will. When I was sold, I sold myself again. Some knaves have done it in lands, and I am body for money, and I have the hire. But sweet, no more. Tis hazard of discovery our discourse, and then prevention takes off all our hopes. For only but to take her leave of me, my wife is coming. Who coming? Your wife? No, no, thou art here. The woman, I knew not how to call her now, but after this day she shall be quite forgot and have no name in my remembrance. See, see, she's come. Enter Susan. Go, lead the horses to the hill's top. There I'll meet thee. Uh, nay, with your favour, let him stay a little. I, I would part with him too, because he is your sole companion, and I'll begin with him reserving you the last. Ay, with all my heart. Uh, you may hear if it please you, sir. No, tis not fit. Some rudiments I conceive they must be to overlook my slippery footings, and so... Oh, indeed, sir. Tush, I know it must be so, and it is necessary. On, but be brief. And Winifred walks forward. What charge soe'er you lay upon me, mistress? I shall support it faithfully, being honest to my best strength. I believe it shall be no other. I know you were commended to my husband by a noble knight. Oh, God. Oh, oh, mine eyes. Oh, no. What, what else, thee, lad? Something hit mine eye. It makes it water still, even as you said, commended me, commended to my husband. Some door, I think it was. I was forsooth commended to him by Sir Arthur Clarington whose servant once my thorny was himself. <laughs> that title, methinks, should make you almost fellows, or at the least much more than a servant, and I'm sure he will respect you so. Your love to him, then, needs no spur from me, and what for my sake you will ever do, tis fit it should be bought with something more, uh, more than fair entreats. Look, here's a jewel for thee, a, a pretty wanton label for thine ear, and I would have it hang there still to whisper these words to thee. Thou hast my jewel with thee. It, it is but earnest of a larger bounty when thou returnst with praises of thy service, which I am confident thou wilt deserve. Why, thou art many now besides thyself. Thou mayst be servant, friend, and wife to him. A, a good wife is them all. A friend can play the wife and servant's part and shift enough. No less the servant can the friend and wife. <laughs> Tis all but sweet society, good counsel, interchanged loves, yes, and counsel keeping. Not done yet. Uh, even now, sir. Mistress, believe my vow. Your severe eye were it present to command. Your bounteous hand, were it then buy to buy or bribe my service, shall not make me more dear or near unto him than I shall voluntary. I'll be all your charge, servant, friend, wife to him. Wilt thou? Uh, now blessings go with thee for it. Uh, courtesies shall meet thee coming home. Pray you say plainly, mistress. Are you jealous of him? If you be, I'll look to him that way too. Oh, sayst thou so? I would thou hadst a woman's bosom now. We have weak thoughts within us. Alas, there's nothing so strong in us as suspicion. But I dare not, nay, I will not think so hardly of my thorny. 
Believe it, mistress. I'll be no pander to him. And if I find any loose lubric scapes in him, I'll watch him. And at my return, protest I'll show you all. He shall hardly offend without my knowledge. Thine own diligence is that I press, and not the curious eye over his faults. Farewell. If I should never see thee more, take it forever. Prithee, take that along with thee, handing and haste his, thee. Handing his sword to Winifred? And haste thee to the hill's top. I'll be there instantly. Uh, no haste, I prithee, slowly as thou canst. Exit Winifred. Pray, let him obey me now. Tis happily his last service to me. <laughs> My power is e'en a going out of sight. Why would you delay? We have no other business now but to part. And will not that sweetheart ask a long time? Methinks it is the hardest piece of work that e'er I took in hand. Fie, fie, why look? I'll make it plain and easy to you. Farewell. And he kisses her. Uh, alas, I, I'm not half perfect in it yet. I must have it read o'er a hundred times. Pray you take some pains, I confess my dullness. What a thorn this rose grows on. Parting were sweet, but what a trouble twill be to obtain it. Come again, again, farewell. He kisses yet, her again. Yet wilt return all questions of my journey, my stay, employment and revisitation. Fully, I have answered all. There is nothing now behind, but nothing and that nothing is more hard than anything than all the everythings uh this request what is it uh, that i may bring you through one pasture more up to yon knot of trees amongst those shadows i'll vanish from you they shall teach me how why tis granted come walk then nay not too fast they say slow things have best perfection. The gentle shower wets to fertility. The churlish storm may mischief with his bounty. The baser beasts take strength even from the womb, but the Lord Lion's wealth is feeble, long. And exeunt. And that's the end of the scene. Oh my. More dissembling from Frank. Um, is it just me or is he getting more callous as the play goes on? Mm. Uh, Lynn, did, did, did you look like you wanted to say something there? Just agreeing with that. Yeah, this, yeah. B doing bad things just seems to be making him a bad person. He, I, that, that sense that he's getting more heartless. Yeah, totally agree with that. Yeah, this, these, these playwrights really seem to enjoy um, manipulating us as the audience, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the ironies of that conversation between Winifred and Susan. You'll be sort of his substitute wife. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yikes. So much yikes. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Was, mm, yes, if I had a cushion to hand, I probably would have been, yeah, hiding behind it at that point. Yeah. Uh, Bryony. I just want to say sorry, everybody. I'm just reading it. Bell <laughs> 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 he, he, he is a bit. Uh, somebody brought up. Uh, um, Eric brought up a good point in the chat about um, what about the child? I mean, Winifred is meant to be disguised as a as a serving boy here, and yet we did hear in uh, the very first scene she was described as being with child. So I've kind of been assuming that in those early scenes that she that that was visible, but obviously. Obviously not. Uh, what do people think, Rachel? Um, e even if she's not physically visible, I mean the hormonal changes that people can go through it, um, in that time. You know how she breaks out crying here. There could be that um, that that you know could come into play. The some uh, you know hormonal mood swings of that. Um, I don't know, maybe just a, another thing to, uh, you know, that an actor could play with a different level or layer that could be played with there. Mm -hmm. And the Ningle thing that was said, 
um, last time, you know, her coming in disguise afterward as uh, dressed as a serving boy, it, uh, you know, maybe plays into that that little parallel. Mm, yes, she's become his ningle, even though she's actually his wife. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I think the wife. Uh, I think the the crying. I mean, yeah, that that's yeah. She could absolutely be hormonal as well, but it was it was because. Um, she heard Susan refer to Frank as her husband, wasn't it? I think that was the thing that made her cry. I was just wondering about how you'd actually uh, square it on stage with making it clear to the obvious in the first scene that she's pregnant and then making her not so pregnant that uh, Susan doesn't realize she's a girl dressed as a, as a, as a serving boy in, in, in this scene. Uh, Bryony. Is it just the power of the early modern disguise, though? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're so good that like, even parents yes. don't recognise their own children. It's true. And the children yeah. big reveal. Yeah. Yes. Maybe they. Maybe she just thinks he's a, a, he's a little fat boy. Yeah. She does seem quite naive and and maybe yes. a bit gullible as well. So maybe yes. yeah. That's... Maybe that's part of the comedy. Oh yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah, Lois. I think it's just that, you know, they've established in the first scene that she's pregnant and then they can conceal it after this. I mean, a cloak or something would be enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A cloak yeah. is actually all it needs, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Good, that's good that's what the costume designer in me was thinking is a, is a cloak. Or the other possibility is that she's already given birth. Enough time has passed that she had a baby at her uncle's. I think they the, mentioned the, I mean, that. The play, the play will make that clear later whether she's still pregnant or whatever but yeah just like a, a cloak a nice big full cloak so that her shape is disguised yeah yeah good good point thank you for sorting that out for me eric i, I was just gonna say that it's interesting how thus far we we're in act three scene two well going on to act three scene three but like most of the scenes seem to be almost duologues they're not like these mm. big ensemble scenes they're kind of very restrained you've got like if at most you had like four or five characters on stage at, at the most but i don't know it's just an interesting sort of so many things to do with doubling that might make it even more interesting yeah, yeah. Ab ab absolutely and i mean it's um it's a good it's a good point because we the, the clowns come on every so often we did have a big scene yesterday where everybody was on stage um with the with the two sets of uh, well, well, not the two sets of lovers, the, the daughters and then the, the suitors um, and the fathers. But um, yeah, it's it's quite spare and pared down, isn't it? Which which um, and you've got. Yes, you've got. Uh, and we seem to be it's it's quite modern, I think, in the way it's it, we have we, we have Frank and Susan. We have a Frank and Susan scene and then we switch and we get a bit of uh, light comedy and then we're back to Frank and Susan and then presumably we're going to switch again in the next scene and it's just it's that's uh, that is that reminds me of sort of modern editing um, which is which is yeah quite interesting and, and the duologues as well Elizabeth you're muted thank you Sarah yeah I was really thinking about the title because we're more than halfway through the play now and um i was wondering if the title was one of those things that was done as like a draw yeah. it was like oh the witch of edmonton it's like oh that sounds quite juicy oh i'll go and see that <laughs> and then it kind of tricks you into coming and seeing a kind of a play of manners or um something that's a little bit more risque mm. about cultural and society norms and things like that rather than about witchcraft and spirituality um because we've gone quite far into the play and the witch is, doesn't seem to be that much of a main character. That's very true. Um, she, yeah, she's only been in one scene so far, I think. And instead we have this, yeah, quite cerebral, I mean, very clever and very gripping. And I'm, I'm totally into it because I want to find out what happens to Susan and Winifred. But, but yeah, it's really got nothing to do with her at all so far, <laughs> has it? Uh, Bryony, then Eric. I really love that idea, Elizabeth, especially because I don't know something about this text and how like the layers and the twists and turns and absolute like, I feel like I'm being led along by the nose completely and I'm reading it. So I think if you if you produced it right, you could really make the audience feel so immersed and involved in, in what's happening with this. So I like the idea that, that it's just another trick, the name. Mm. Uh, Eric, did you have your hand up? 
Yeah, I was going to say that also the clowns had mentioned, well, actually, witches are so commonplace nowadays that, you know, we, we've got three or four or five of them. And then, you know, there's not just one. So there's a part of me going, maybe they, there's an implication that the women are actually witches, like sort of not to the, not in that, not in the traditional sense of like, you know, bewitching people, but sort of representations of, I don't know, maybe. Or also men could be witches as well. In, that's, really modern intelligence. that's a very interesting point hold that thought eric <laughs> well we'll come back to that later lois yeah well eric just made me remember that frank's idiotic speech to susan about how one eye has cupid in it and the other eye has adonis in it both shooting at him you know i mean that suggests it's a version of witchcraft i mean it's a, again it's sort of rubbish uh, one eye is inflaming him sensually whereas the other eye like adonis is is being terribly chased, but uh, but it's the same notion. Women, women's eyes have some sort of weird power because they worry about uh, Sawyer having the evil eye. Yes, and uh, also Cuddy uh, when he was talking to Sawyer yesterday about uh, about the fact that that, that Kate uh, Catherine, the the woman he's fallen in love with, she had a devil, a demon that came out of her eye and hit him in the heart feathers, which I, <laughs> I thought was kind of entertaining. Yeah. Um, yeah so yes that that idea that uh that that witches are yes only witches maybe there are more witches out there um that just aren't called so that's a that's a, an idea i think we should uh, maybe hang on to and come back to later right okay uh let's move on then if no one else has anything to say we're going into Act 3, Scene 3, and enter the dog. Now for an early mischief and a sudden. The mind's about it now. One touch from me soon sets the body forward. Enter Frank and Susan. Your request is out yet. Will you leave me? What? So churlishly? You'll make me stay forever, rather than part with such a sound from you. Why, you almost anger me. Pray you be gone. You have no company, and it is very early. Some hurt may betide you homewards. Ash, I fear none. To leave you is the greatest hurt I can suffer. And besides, I expect your father and mine own to meet me back or overtake me with you. They began to stir when I came after you. I know they'll not be long. So I shall have more trouble. The dog rubs against him. Thank you for that. Then I'll ease all at once. It is done now. What I ne'er thought on, you shall not go back. Why, shall I go along with thee? Oh, sweet music. No, to a better place. Uh, any place, I, I, I'm there at home where thou pleasest to have me. At home? I'll leave you in your last lodging. I must kill you. Oh, fine. You'd fright me from you. You see, I had no purpose. I'm unarmed, and tis this minute's decree, and it must be. Look, this will serve your turn. He draws a knife. I'll not turn from it, if you be earnest, sir. Yet you may tell me wherefore you'll kill me. Because you're a whore. There's one deep wound already. A whore. It was ever further from me than the thought of this black hour. A whore. Yes, I'll prove it. And you shall confess it. You are my whore. No wife of mine. The word admits no second. I was before wedded to another. Have her still. I do not lay the sin unto your charge. Tis all mine own. Your marriage was my theft, for I espoused your dowry, and I have it. I did not purpose to have added murder. The devil did not prompt me till this minute. You might have safe returned. Now you cannot. You have dogged your own death. And he stabs her. And I deserve it. I am glad my fate was so intelligent. It was some good spirit's motion. Thy, oh, twas time. How many years might I have slept in sin, the sin of my most hatred, too, adultery. Nay, sure, 
"'Twas likely that the most was past, for I meant never to return to you after this parting. Well, I bet I thank you more. You have done lovingly, leaving yourself, that you would thus bestow me on another. Thou, thou art my husband, death, and I embrace thee with all the love I have. Forget the stain of my unwitting sin, and then I come a crystal virgin to thee, my soul's purity shall with bold wings ascend the doors of mercy, for innocence is ever her companion. Not yet mortal. I would not linger you or leave you a tongue to blab. He stabs her again. Now, heaven reward you ne'er the worse for me. I did not think that death had been so sweet, nor I so apt to love him. I could ne'er die better had I stayed forty years for preparation, for I'm in charity with all the world. Let me for once be thine example, heaven, do to this man as I him free forgive, and may he better die and better live. And she dies. Tis done, and I am in. Once past our height, we scorned the deepest abyss. This follows now to heal her wounds by dressing of the weapon, arms, thighs, hands, any place. He wounds himself. We must not fail. Light scratches, giving such deep ones the best I can to bind myself to this tree. Now is the storm, which if blown o'er, many fair days may follow. He binds himself to a tree, the dog ties him behind and exits. So, so, I'm fast. I did not think I could have done so well behind me. How prosperous and effectual mischief sometimes is. Help! Help! Murder! 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 And enter Carter and old Thorny. Ha! Who tolls the bell for? Oh! Oh! Ah, me, the cause appears too soon. My child, my son. Susan, girl, child, not speak to thy father. Ha! Huh. Oh, lend me some assistance to o'ertake this hapless woman. Let's o'ertake the murderers. Speak whilst thou canst. Anon may be too late. I fear thou hast death's mark upon thee too. I know them both, yet such an oath is passed as pulls damnation up if it be broke. I dare not name them. Think what force men do. Keep oath with murderers. That were a conscience to hold the devil in. Nay, sir, I can describe them. Shall show them as familiar as their names. The taller of the two at this time, where it is satin doublet white, but crimson lined. Hose of black satin, cloak of scarlet. Oh, Warbeck! 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 Do you list to this, sir? Yes, yes. I listen you. Here's nothing to be heard. The yeah, other's cloak, branched, velvet, black, velvet lined his suit. I have him already. Summerton, Summerton. By the revenge all this. Come, sir, the first work is to pursue the murderers when we have removed these mangled bodies hence. Sir, take that carcass there and give me this. I will not own her now. She's none of mine. Bob me off with a dumb show. No, I'll have life. This is my son too. And while there's life in him, tis half mine. Take you half that silence for it. When I speak, I look to be spoken to. Forgetful slut. Alas, what grief may do now. Look, sir, I'll take this load of sorrow with me. I do, and I'll have this. Exit old Thorny with Susan in his arms. How do you, sir? Oh, very ill, sir. Yes, I think so. But tis well you can speak yet. There's no music but in sound. Sound it must be. I have not wept these 20 years before, and that I guess was ere that girl was born. Yet now methinks, if I but knew the way, my heart so full I could weep night and day. And he exits with Frank. And that is the end of the scene. Well, as Eric said in the chat, that took a turn. 
Yowlies. Poor old Susan. Um, and the way he killed her as well, um, the, the way the scene is constructed so that, uh, you know, he, he, he stabs her and she speaks and then he stabs her again and she speaks again. I mean, I know we have, you know, like the, the, there is there is a, um, a tradition of this, of, of people taking a long time to die and having many speeches, but there's something about the way this is done in particular that is, seems very distressing. Bryony. Obviously, I made some choices with how I read it, but I kind of feel like the way, like the, the way it was written, it, it felt like the way to do it. He did seem really, really just like unfeeling about it all. Just this is this is what's happening. I am I'm going to murder you now. Stab, mm. stab. Carry on talking. Because you get the the kind of thing where somebody has their their big death speech and you know a bit more of a death speech and stuff but it's not normally like a, a weird cold conversation about mm. like yeah this is what I'm doing now I'm gonna die mm, he's so cold isn't he and I mean it's uh, just for anybody who was who, who, who missed that uh, like that it's implied that the dog has the dog rubs past him and makes makes him murder her uh, but then he's the fact that he's become gradually more and more callous in the previous scenes it's all kind of it fits with that as well so how much of this is the dog and how much of it is yeah. him that's something that we could definitely play with in a in a production did lois did i see your hand uh, uh, yeah well i was just going to you know point out that it is partly the effect of the dog but that uh, uh, you know as you say it, it you don't know how much to blame it really but it's, it's as if you know he's he's been getting nastier and nastier but somehow with the dog that's suddenly, oh, why don't I just kill her? You know, it's a sort of impulse. Yes, and it's, mm. it's it, that, what, then that makes it even more extraordinary because on the one hand, it's an impulse, but then on the other hand, he has the foresight to think, oh, right, now I need to cut myself and, and make it look, tie myself to a tree. So it's, oh God, the deviousness of the man. Uh, yeah. Eric, then uh, Rachel, uh, then Lynn. Sorry, I missed the script there. Uh, I messed it up again. Anyway, um, what I was going to say is that this actually reminded me a lot of Arden of Faversham, where you've got a comedy plot, comedy plot, comedy plot, then somebody, th then the neighbor gets killed off, and then suddenly, like, the, the sister is the one who actually, coincidentally, is called Susan, um, is uh, the one who gets pinned sort of for helping her brother get away with it, kind of thing. I, if I remember cor correctly, he he commits suicide or something. I can't. I can't remember how he dies or if he dies at all. But it's just an interesting thing that, like, yeah, just yeah, the women pay for the men's crimes. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, they absolutely do. And it is a. I mean, yes, it's described as a tragedy comedy. Uh, so, but yeah, it's definitely we've definitely gone from from comedy to tragic in a very short space of time. Um, Rachel, then Lynn, then uh, Stephen. Uh yeah um this part after he like ties himself to the tree there's something sort of like um uh i think it was written like maybe a hundred years ago maybe 90 years ago or something rashomon they like made it into a movie that it's a it's a little bit like agatha christie or something like that it's a, it just meant to be a false narration and it's the this guy gets murdered in the woods and everybody has a different story about what it was and who did what and who caused it and who was the aggressor. Um, so I'm getting like those vibes from it. Uh, but more to the point of the play, uh, another question, uh, even though Frank is tied to a tree, why does Carter start cursing his dead daughter? That is very disturbing. Um, uh, Lynn, I was going to come to you anyway, so like yes if you have any thoughts yeah. on that that was uh, that I, I just uh, the same question why is he calling poor dead susan a slut like what is your malfunction mister Ew. <laughs> um, but the other thing i was going to point out is like frank isn't i mean not only is he heartless and unfeeling he's actually getting a little sadistic mm. like actively cruel he doesn't have to tell susan oh by the way i was married to someone else before i married you so we're not really married so that makes you my mistress mm. um i know the sin isn't your fault but there you go <laughs> he doesn't have to tell her all of that yeah no it's it, just it, like it, 
it's like he wants to torture her before he kills her. Oh, mm-hmm. so he's gotten, he's really debased himself. He has really sunk low. Yeah, he has. The, 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 the Carter thing, I mean, Old Thorny does have a line, alas, what grief may do now. I mean, yeah, people do do strange things things when they're when they're uh, overcome by grief but it is interesting that the playwrights chose to put that bit in with Carter because Carter up to now has been a fairly um he seemed to be a fairly uh sort of sanguine and uh quite sort of jolly character fairly harmless it, so is this perhaps I mean the dog has has left the the scene by this point he's already exited so we, we can't put it down to the effect of the dog but it is interesting that the yes the evil seems to be uh, influencing everybody who who steps into it. Uh, uh, I saw S- Stephen's hand earlier, and then I'll go to Briny. Uh, well, some of this has already been said. Um, it, it's interesting that the the dog ties ties him, but he thinks he's done it himself. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's not so much what he does as what he says that. The dog says, I will influence, you know, that he's got the idea in his head and I'll just, all we need to do is make it happen. But what he says is just kind of standard male script, the period. It's it's the patriarchy, you know. Uh, and uh, he knows exactly the words to say. This has been run and rerun. Uh, and it does turn up in other plays, doesn't it? And it reminded me very much of a, a play that Rowley had a hand in called The Changeling, which is sort of around this time. Um, and he's channeling a character called De Flores. Mm-hmm. And so this, in, in a sense, you know, what's interesting to it for me is how readily he finds the words for the deed that the demon has put him up to and how, how basically these are culturally scripted. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, the response of uh, once the dog has left, well, uh, yeah, the dog is not making them do that because this is the script. This is the script for, for male violence uh, against women. This is, you know, a kind of long series of justifications and uh, and so forth. And so, you know, certainly certainly now, you know, that the, all, the, all the devil is doing is just revealing what we already know. The fact mm-hmm. there's a devil associated with it, you know, gives gives us a perspective on it, perhaps, and perhaps gave you know some of the original audience a perspective on it too. But it's it's what they say, not not what they do, that it kind of kind of freaks me out about this scene. He's it's just there on the shelf, and he reaches for it, and he brings all those words and ideas down, and then we're off in that script. Dead woman, no daughter of mine. Yeah. I have a son. You know, and uh, <laughs> the, the, the the devil just kind of starts that ball rolling. Mm. We were talking yesterday about how it was very interesting that the, the, the playwrights seem to be aware, like all those tropes, um, especially those misogynistic tropes are there, but it's interesting that the playwrights seem to, you know, us with our modern uh, take on it, see them. But it's interesting that the playwrights seem to have been aware of them too, and actually were making a point of highlighting them. And I mean, you're absolutely right. He, you know, they do that um, with devastating effect uh, in this scene. Uh, Bryony, and then Dan. I think I saw your hand, and then Lois, and then we, we've got to keep crack on, guys, because we're we're running out of time. <clears throat> Um, it's almost like the, the, this journey. If you think about the way the dogs behave throughout this play, it is real change from the start. The first person that we saw the dog interacting with with was Sawyer and um, it was it was completely different and it was kind of almost she felt a little bit like she'd been backed into a corner uh, at the very least to to have to make this contract with him because he he did kind of say I'm going to kill you if you don't. Um, And now it's just, you know, it's turned and, and it was very ritualistic and it was very like steeped in these rules in this framework of this is how these things work. They they suckle from the witch mark um and now he just he just rubs this guy's leg and Mm. and it's almost like as if it's this chain reaction and it's getting more you know because of this this first deal that he's done somehow he's gaining power or something um yeah 
Mm. And we do, it's that thing that we talked about before as well of, of the dog being a reflection of the person's psychology you know rather than anything else because we've seen him now with Frank we've seen him with Cuddy and we've seen him with Sawyer and as you say Bryony he's different with all three or at least the outcomes are different with all three um uh, Dan I'll say just add something that's that seemed that's probably pretty obvious in addition to changeling um Dr Faustus hmm. as well um yeah. You know, which had just been revived a few years, just what 2016. They already had they they had yet another edition come out with a similar type of title page woodcut in, in terms of the idea of there's a there's a mortal dealing with another devil there. Um, but I do want to say, second, what Stephen's saying about the idea of that it was always in the person. I think that at, at the end of the day, this is a morality play about that that. It, the, the devil's just basically giving the person the, uh, I guess, the extra push that that person himself um, had had sought out in the first place. Mm. Lois. Yeah, a couple of things. One, I wanted to defend uh, old Carter. I think he's cracking up and that, mm. uh, I mean, he calls her a slut because she doesn't answer him. Of course, she doesn't answer him because she's dead and he knows she's dead, but uh, he's just... Uh, it's, uh, there, there are a number of situations where people do that. I mean, there are several which, which I can't mention, but uh, I guess even, you know, the, I think the addition to the Spanish tragedy has Hieronimo uh, refusing to recognize that the corpse is that of his son and saying, I wonder how this fellow got his clothes, you know, which is the mm. same sort of thing in a way. Yeah. I mean, mm. and uh, there, there are other bits that I could mention, but anyway, uh, I, re I really think it, it, as, uh, uh, as Thorny says, it's really just that he's so upset that he can't uh, take it in. And then he's saying, you know, I, I'll keep with the live one, you have the dead one. It's not really so much that, you know, I don't care about my daughter, I, mm. I'd rather have my son. I mean, that's more of, I think, our modern take on it. Mm. But it is more, I, I want life, not death. I just can't cope with death, in fact. Yeah, it's um, a denial yeah. of reality. Yeah. yeah, the other thing is that, uh, I mean, it's awful, everything that Frank says to Susan, but uh, it enables her to die actually happy because she's getting out of becoming, I mean, she just couldn't possibly have lived given her, her standards of morality and so on with the idea that, that she was technically a whore, which, uh, which she would be. I mean, her marriage is invalid now. Yeah, uh, yes, that's a good point. I Oh, we could have a half hour discussion about that, but we, <laughs> yes. let's not, because we need to yeah. we need yeah. to crack on. It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a good point that you raise. Right, let's uh, move on. Act three, scene four. Uh, enter Sir Arthur, Clarington, Warbeck and Somerton. Come, gentlemen, we must all help to grace the nimble-footed youth of Edmonton that are so kind to call us up, up, up today within High Morris. I could wish it for... The <coughs> uh, hang on. And uh, Warbeck's just having a, 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 a... I think maybe the dog has just brushed across his leg. <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, well, well, not the demonic dog at least. Are you back with us, Warbeck? Uh, yes, we'll give it a try. I could wish it for the best. It were the worst now. Absurdities, in my opinion, ever the best dancer in a Morris. But they'd rather sleep than see him. Not well, sir. Faith, not ever this leaden. But yet I know no cause for it. Huh. Now am I beyond my own condition highly disposed to mirth? Well, you may yet have a Morris to help both, to strike you in a dump and make him merry. Enter Sawgut with the Morris dancers, etc. Come, will you set yourselves in Morris Ray? The four bell, second bell, tenor and great bell, made Marion for the same bell. But where's the weathercock now, the hobby horse? Is not Banks come yet? What a spike tis. Uh, when set you forward, gentlemen? We stay but for the hobby horse, sir. All our footmen are ready. And Somerton? Sorry. It is marvel your horse should be behind your foot. Yes, sir, he goes further about. We can come in at the wicket, but the broad gate must be open for him. Enter Cuddy Banks with the hobby horse, followed by the dog. Oh, we stayed for you, sir. 
Only my horse wanted a shoe, sir. But we shall make you amends ere we part. Aye, well said. Make them drink ere they begin. And to servants with beer. A bowl, I pray thee, and a little for my horse. He'll mount the better. Nay, give me. I must drink to him. He'll not pledge else. He drinks. Here, Hobby. Holds the bowl to the hobby horse. I pray you. No, not drink. You see, gentlemen, we can but bring our horse to the water. He may choose whether he'll drink or no. He drinks again. Good moral, made plain by history. Strike up, Father Sorgut. Strike up. In when you will, children. Cuddy mounts the hobby. Now, in the name of the best foot forward. He endeavours to play, but the fiddle gives no sound. How now? Not a word in thy guts. I think, children, my instrument has caught cold on the sudden. My mingles knavery, Black Tom's doing. Why, what mean you, Father Sorgut? Mean you, Father Sorgut. Why, what would you have him do? You hear his fiddle is speechless. I'll lay mine ear to my instrument, that my poor fiddle is bewitched. I played the flowers in May, e'en now, as sweet as a violet. Now twill not go against the hair. You see, I can make no more music than a beetle of a cow turd. Let me see. Father saw a gut. He takes the fiddle. Say once you had a brave hobby horse that you were ho beholding to. I'll play and dance to. Ningle away with it. He gives it to the dog, who plays the Morris. Hi, um, Mary, sir. Hey, sir. They dance, enter a constable and officers. Away with your jollity. Tis too sad an hour. Sir Arthur Clarington, your own assistance, in the king's name, I charge for apprehension of these two murderers, Warbeck and Somerton. Ha? Huh? Flash murderers? <laughs> Well, this has awakened my melancholy. And struck my mirth down flat, murderers. The accusation is flat against you, gentlemen. Sir, you may be satisfied with this. Shows his warrant. I hope you'll quietly obey my power. It will make your cause the fairer. <laughs> with all our uh -huh. hearts, sir. Here's my rival taken up for hangman's meat. Tom told me he was about a piece of villainy. Mates and Morris men, you see here's no longer piping, no longer dancing. This news of murder has slain the Morris. You that go the footway, fare ye well. I am for a gallop. Come, Ningle. And Cuddy canters off with the hobby horse and the dog. Sorgut strikes his fiddle, which sounds as before. Nay, nay, and my fiddle be come to himself again. I cannot. I think the devil has been abroad amongst us today. I'll keep thee out of thy fit now, if I can. Exit with the Morris dancers. These things are full of horror, full of pity. But if this time be constant to the proof, the guilt of both these gentlemen, I dare take on mine own danger. Yet, however, sir, your, your power must be obeyed. Uh, oh, most willingly, sir. Tis a most sweet affliction. I could not meet a joy in the best shape with better will. Come, fear not, sir, nor, nor judge nor evidence can bind him or who's freed by conscience. Mine stands so upright to the middle zone, it takes no shadow to it. It goes alone. And they exit, and that's the end, not only of the scene, but the act. <laughs> Oh, so again, we have another quick turn there. We've gone from the tragedy back to the comedy. Um, yeah. Interleaving of the two there is uh, uh, quite striking. And the dog, the dog goes from causing all this absolute, like sadism and torture. And now all of a sudden he's prancing around with the Morris men. That is really quite disturbing. Yeah. What do we think? Mm. Elizabeth. 
Yeah, I was really, I really enjoyed it. I think it was Dan yesterday that said, that gave us this idea of puppetry. And I really loved the idea of the dog being this puppet that kind of scampers across the stage, a bit like War Horse, like the horses in War Horse. But um, when he started playing the fiddle, I realised that it must be a man in a dog suit. It wasn't going to necessarily be a puppet. Because and I just love the fact that this dog can do so many things. He can be in so many places at once and he can do so much harm. Yeah, well, hey, he's supernatural. He can do whatever he likes. Apart from he can't kill people, apparently. Although he can make people... He, he said yesterday he couldn't kill people, but it's clear he can make people kill other people. So, yeah. Hey, uh, Lois, did I see your hand? Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking of uh, Hey Diddle Diddle Little Cat and the Fiddle, the, the Cow Jumped Over the Moon. I mean, it's, uh, it's a verse about everything being backwards and upside down, and I think it's the same kind of thing here, mm. with the, uh, the dog playing the fiddle. Uh, it's a sign, obviously, that something really weird is happening. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say. Uh, I'm sure I saw other hands. Uh, Lynn. A small point. Uh, earlier in the play, when we were first introduced to Warbeck as a rival for Susan's affections, we didn't really see much to like or admire about him. Susan was really not into him. Um, but he sort of seems to be have grace under pressure here. He's risen to the occasion. He knows he's unfairly uh, accused and he is confident that the truth will out. And it's just like, yes, fine. I am just as happy to um, confront this false accusations as any joy in the best shape because I'm not afraid I've done nothing wrong. So I mean, that, that's a kind of courage and uprightness I didn't look for in him. Mm. Yeah, he's kind of almost like the reverse Frank, isn't he? Because we started off with Frank like, oh, he's being duped. This, yeah. this he's been, you know, the, he's an innocent being duped, and 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 then yes, it all went pear shaped from there. And <laughs> we've almost had the reverse happening to a lesser extent with with Warbeck because he started off, and we all thought he was quite creepy, and and now he's we're seeing a different side of his character. Uh, there were other hands that I saw. I thought. Although maybe not, in which case I will press on because um, we are getting to the end of our time. So let's go straight into Act 4, Scene 1. Now this is a very, very long scene and we will not get to the end of it. Um, but we'll, So we'll, we'll find a place to pause. Um, a lot's going to happen, but we'll start with the entrance of Old Banks and several countrymen. So these are not the clowns, well, they could be the clowns. But they're described now uh, in the stage direction as countrymen. My horse this morning runs most piteously of the glanders, whose nose yesternight was as clean as any man's here now coming from the barbers. And this I'll take my death upon as long of this jadish witch, Mother Sawyer. I took my wife and a serving man in our town of Edmonton, thrashing in my barn together such corn as country wenches carry to market. And examining my polecat, what, why she did so, she swore in her conscience she was bewitched. And that witch have we about us but Mother Sawyer. Rid the town of her, else all our wives will do nothing else but dance about other country maples. Our cattle fall, our wives fall, our daughters fall, and maidservants fall, and we ourselves shall not be able to stand if this beast be suffered to graze amongst us. Enter Hamlock with, with thatch and a lighted link. Burn the witch, the witch, the witch. What, what, what has uh, got there? What has got there? A handful of thatch plucked, plucked off a hovel of hers. And they say, when tis burning, if she be a witch, she'll come running. Fire it, fire it. I'll stand between thee and home for any danger. Hamlet sets fire to the thatch. Enter Mother Sawyer, running. Diseases, plagues, the curse of an old woman follow and fall upon you. Countrymen, are you, are you come, you old trot? Oh, no, that's yeah, not the, yeah. the, the countrymen say that. Yeah, they do. Oh. Are you, uh, you, you, you come, you old trot? You hot whore, must we fetch you with fire in your tail? 
This thatch is as good as a jury to prove she is a witch. Ah, witch. Ow, oh, witch. Set oh, fire, fire on her. Fire on her. Fire on fire. Shall I be murdered by a bed of serpents? Help! Help! Enter Sir Arthur Clarington and a justice. Hang on! Hang on! Killer. 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 Killer! Oh no! Forbear this violence! A crew of villains, a knot of bloody hangmen, set to torment me. I know not why. Alas, neighbour Banks, are you a ringleader in mischief? Fie! To abuse an aged woman. Woman? <laughs> a she hellcat? A witch? Uh, to prove her one, we no sooner set fire on the thatch of her house, but in she came running, as if the devil had sent her in a barrel of gunpowder. Which trick as surely proves her a witch, as the pox in a snuffling nose is a sign a man is a whoremaster? Come, come. Firing her thatch? Ridiculous! Take heed, sirs, what you do. Unless your proofs come better armed, instead of turning her into a witch, you'll prove yourselves stark fools. Fools? 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 fools. Pray, Master Justice, what you call him, hear me but in one thing. This grumbling devil owes me, I know, no good will ever since I fell out with her. And breaketh my back with beating me. I'll break it worse. Wilt thou? Uh, you must not threaten her. Tis against the law. Go on. So, sir, ever since, having a dun cow tied up in my backside, let me go thither or but cast mine eye on her. And if I should be hanged, I cannot choose, <laughs> though it be ten times in an hour, but run to the cow and, taking up her tail, kiss, <laughs> saving your worship's reverence, my cow behind, that the whole town of Edmonton has been ready to be pissed themselves with laughing me to scorn. And this is long of her? Uh, who the devil else? For if any man is any man such an ass to be such a baby if he were not bewitched? Nay, if she be a witch in the harms she does, and in such sports, she may escape burning. Go, go, vex, pray vex her not. She is a subject, and you must not be judges of the law to strike her as you please. We'll find no, 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 we'll, we'll find cut cut enough to strike her. Uh, no lips to kiss, but my cows. Rots and foul maladies eat up thee and thine. And X and old banks and countrymen, and we'll keep going for just a little bit longer. So, Justice. Who is on now, Mother Sawyer, but this gentleman, myself, and you? Let us to some. Tell us honestly, and with a free confession, we'll do our best to wean you from it. Are you a witch, or no? I am none. Well, be not so furious. I am none. None but base curse so bark at me. I'm none, or would I were. If every poor old woman be trod on thus by slaves, reviled, kicked, beaten, as I am daily, she to be revenged had me turn witch. And you to be revenged, and you to be revenged, uh, have sold your soul to the devil. Keep thine own from him. You are too saucy and too bitter. Saucy? By what commission can he send my soul on the devil's errand more than I can his? Is he a landlord of my soul to thrust it when he lists out of door? Know whom you speak to. A man, perhaps no man, men in gay clothes, whose backs are laden with titles and with honours, are within far more crooked than I am. 
and if I be a witch, more witch-like. You're a base hellhound, and now, sir, let me tell you far and near, she's brooded for a woman that maintains a spirit that sucks her. I defy thee. Go, go. I can, if need be, bring an hundred voices in here in Edmonton that shall loud proclaim thee for a secret and pernicious witch. Ha! Ha! Oh, do you laugh? Why laugh you? At my name. The brave name this knight gives me. Witch. The name of witch so pleasing to thine ear? Pray, sir, give way and let her tongue gallop on. A witch? Who is not? Hold not that universal name in scorn, then. What, are your painted things in princes' courts, upon whose eyelids lust sits, blowing fires to me burn men's souls in sensual hot desires, upon whose naked paps a lecher's thought acts sin in fouler shapes than can be wrought? But those work not as you do. No, but far worse. These by enchantments can whole lordships change to trunks of rich attire, turnplows and teams, to Flanders mares and coaches and huge trains of servitors to a French butterfly. Have you not city, witch, city witches who can turn their husbands' wares, whole standing shops of wares, to sumptuous tables, gardens of stolen sin, in one year wasting what scarce twenty win. Are not these witches? Yes, yes, but the law casts not an eye on these. Why then on me, or any lean old beldam? Reverence once had want to wait on age. Now an old woman, Ill-favoured grown with years, if she be poor, must be called bored or witch. Such so abused are the coarse witches, t'other are the fine, spun for the devil's own wearing. And so is thine. She on whose tongue a whirlwind sits to blow a man out of himself, from his soft pillow to lean his head on rocks and fighting waves, is not that scold a witch? The man of law whose honeyed hopes to credulous client draw as bees by tinkling basins to swarm to him from his own hive to work the wax in his. He is no witch, not he. But these men witches are not in trading with hell's merchandise like as you are, that for a word, a look, denial of a coal of fire, kill men, children and cattle. Tell them, sir that do so. Am I accused for such an one? Yes, it will be sworn. Dare any swear I ever tempted maiden with golden hooks flung at her chastity to come and lose her honour, and being lost to pay not a denier for it. Some slaves have done it. Men witches can, without the fangs of law, drawing once one drop of blood put counterfeit pieces away for true gold. By one thing she speaks, I know now she's a witch and dare not, uh, dare no longer hold conference with the fury. Let's then away. Old woman, mend thy life. Get home and pray. Exeunt Sir Arthur and Justice. For his confusion. And we're going to pause there. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So uh, another incredible uh, change of tone uh, for the beginning of Act Four, Lois. Yeah, that's a wonderful bit of irony. That uh, what convinces Sir Arthur that she's a witch is that she knows what he's done with Winifred. Yeah. Uh, or she, or at least, I mean, her accusation is so general that it could apply to all sorts of people. But in mm -hmm. his case, it, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean. It, it, as we were reading that, I was thinking, oh, lady, you've just done yourself no no service there at all, because now he's he's absolutely going to be after her. Um, 
But it's extraordinary, isn't it? The way this starts, you've got this kind of, it's its, it's that trope, isn't it? Of, uh, oh, kill the witch, burn the witch. Oh, look, she, she, she runs out when her house is set on fire. Oh, that means she must be a witch. You've got all this <laughs> terrible, like misogynistic claptrap, which I mean, is, is so much a part of the, the cliche about, about witches. And, and then you have her coming and giving you this incredible, incredible uh, clapback, basically. Um, and this is why I wanted to read to this uh, part because uh, of what you were saying earlier, Eric, about, you know, is there that theme in the play of, um, you know, who is a witch? You know, is are you just a witch if you're named a witch? Or are there male witches? Can other women can be, be considered to be witches? Turns out the playwrights were very much of your, your frame of mind. Uh, Rachel, is that a hand I see? Yeah, I was going to say this, like, you know, star chamber, courtroom, you know, the legal coming to talk to this woman, that it's all, it seems like these are all men accusing her. It's kind of like um, uh, when we were reading the insatiate countess towards the end, and it's all these men condemning her. And then um, also, also that um, uh, Arthur at the end that she's made an enemy out of him you know he's both a man and he's uh, high rank and wealthy and she doesn't have uh, anything and she's talking about um, uh, uh, you know she's spoken uh, her truth and her truth is something that they didn't want to hear uh, and I put in the chat that you know the justice saying to her don't you think you're being a little bitter you know, it's such a piecing of um, her reactions and her emotions. And it's like when a stranger on the street or, a, you know, a coworker, a customer, depending on where you are, comes in and says, you know, smile, you know, and it, it's, you know, you were just having a normal day living your life, but they decided that you weren't performing, um, you weren't performing a certain emotion that they desired to see out of women you know how they have there's that term resting bitch face and it's like that's just somebody's face you know they're not performing and uh, you know trying to play up to please you they're not catering to whatever um insecurities that that individual saying smile has inside them mm. Mm. and it's interesting the way the justice changes as well because to begin with he's quite sort of like well what are you doing to this this poor woman like for heaven's sake stop it you bunch of I mean, he calls them fools. I'd have called them worse personally, but hey, um, you know, he, he, he basically seems to weigh in there and, and, and try and bring a balance of you. But then by the end, yes, he is absolutely dismissing her and telling her to mend thy life because, yes, yeah, she hasn't basically, she hasn't been grateful, has she? And she hasn't, she hasn't smiled and, and done what she's supposed to have done. Uh, Eric and then Lois. But also, she's like the well. I mean, whoever basically—it's very modern because whoever speaks truth to power is set on trial, and that's basically what's happening to her. Mm. It's just like sort of all these, you know, the Me Too movement, all that stuff. If you, if you superimpose that layer on this, especially this scene, it's just like, yeah, yeah. The, it doesn't take much to make a parallel, does it, uh, Lois? And then I think I saw Stephen's hand. Yeah, well, just two things. I mean, one is that they're not exactly burning her house down. I mean, they've taken some thatch from its roof and they are now, you know, at some distance from the house, which is not on the stage, presumably. Uh, they right. set it on fire and that is supposed to be, a, you know, it's one of these superstitions uh, that that will bring a witch running out, which it does. I mean, she, she reacts as if her place was on fire, but I take it it isn't. Uh, it's an illusion. Uh, but the, the other thing, it's sort of interesting, is just the class thing again. I mean, the, the justice and Sir Arthur seem to be taking her part against the countrymen, but it's really because they don't want these lower class people um, taking on the role of justice. I mean, it's not their business. So when they get rid of them, then they start uh, cross-examining yeah. her. Mm. We're gonna do it yeah. properly now. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, Stephen. Uh, well, more or less the same point really, inspired by um, Helen Star Chamber cases. It's it's a public order thing, isn't it? Mm. You know, the sort of primary duty is to, you know, stop the place getting torn to pieces. And then we have a kind of performance of the um, interestedness of the law. These these are these are not kind of salaried officials necessarily in, impartially trying to find the truth of something. They're trying they're trying to work out what's happened, and they bring to it 
every every kind of prejudice and uh, unthinking assumption uh, that that is in the book you know mm. yes absolutely wow it's been uh, quite a roller coaster today uh we've had we've had pretty much we've, we've had it all uh we've had talking dogs we've had murder uh, we've had accusations of witchcraft. We've had possibly real, real witchcraft. Although, yeah, it's 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 interesting. You, I think there is scope for maybe playing that either way. That's something we maybe could discuss tomorrow in the final session. But for now, uh, let's go around the room for final thoughts. And Elizabeth, I want to start with you because you were playing Mother Sawyer in that last scene um, mm. with a great deal of passion. Uh, I, I I felt so like how how did you feel? How was it playing it? And what do you what are your feelings about the play so far? Um, I'm I'm enjoying the play a lot. I think the one of the best things about it is that it's very difficult to tell where it's going. It's very mm. difficult to kind of tell where you know Decker and Co are taking us. Um, what I didn't like or didn't understand was the kind of morality that was set up in the text because we set up a morality of like the dog saying to Sawyer I can't do that because the person is good I can't kill him off but um I can attack his things his like cattle and his corn and stuff like that but then when it comes to Susan Susan's like a really I feel so sorry for her because I feel like she's a really pure character she doesn't seem to do anything wrong to anyone and she makes the kind of awful mistake for falling for Frank and then she ends up murdered and the dog's just kind of there tying Frank to a tree, mm. kind of like saying, you know, giving him his alibi. And I was just wondering, like, that, that morality aspect that was set up in the last section we did doesn't kind of follow through in this section. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. I mean, I suppose you could say that the dog doesn't actually cause susan's death he kind of he becomes the agent for someone else doing doing it so it's not a, di a direct but also i mean yeah there is this thing uh, which i think is is you know we've, we've talked about before in this play of the fact that there that there is an inequality even in the way that the devil treats a woman as 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 opposed to the way he treats a man it's you know it's it's definitely there uh so yeah it's a really it's a really interesting point um uh rachel your final thoughts please oh um i i was just about to write in the chat that the dog how you just said the dog treats men and women differently we get right there at the end that the law treats men and women differently um yeah, besides that, I'm still really enjoying this. I agree a lot um, with Elizabeth and that I, every time I think I know where it's going, it goes somewhere else, but I enjoy where it goes. Um, and the way the subject matter is handled, you know, sometimes we have, we get these, we read these plays and it's like, what do we do with this? And how do we contextualize like these troublesome ways the characters are acting with one another, but all of this feels so pointed and intentional. And there's so much that, uh, you know, even if I'm just looking at it with modern eyes and this isn't the way that they intended it, there's such good writing here. Like all three of these guys are fantastic. Um, that there's so much you could just take, I, I really want to see this play on stage. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. I think there's so much that uh, any production could take and they could work with all these different levels and take all these different things and just say so much to our modern world um, with this. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Bryony, you said earlier that you were enjoying being led by the nose. Are you still feeling that? Yeah, it's just it's just like this wild ride that that is twisting and turning. But like you say, it feels very safe in terms of we're being looked after i'm not i'm not being asked to suspend my belief too far it's it's got you know it's it's got a, a rhythm to it and it feels well crafted um and, and unexpected as well because sometimes you see things if they're set up in advance you see them too much but this just when you think you know where it's going it just flips again and goes in a different direction and i'm still really interested in trying to kind of think of the what what lynn said yesterday about the kind of thinking of this in a more modern way and a more modern setting 
And I think, again, I still don't know where it's landing, but I think there's definitely massive potential for something like that. Mm, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Lynn, uh, speaking of, are you all right there? Are, are, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, the, one doesn't know where to have it, this play, does one? Uh, uh, the shifts in tone are a little, um, or, or, you know, make you a little nauseous here. Um, but I mean, I think in a really pacey production, that could be part of the effect. And, you know, just the, the, the ambiguity of the characters is also so fascinating. I mean, Mother Sawyer is a witch. She, she kind of is. I mean, she has responded to the way society mistreats her by calling on the powers of darkness for revenge. She knows the dog is, is the devil or sent from the devil and she's made a pact with it. I mean, she is a witch. But on the other hand, everything she says in this confrontation with the justice and Sir Arthur is valid. Like, do you know who you're talking to? I'm talking to men men with fancy clothes who are maybe more corrupt on the inside than I am. Mm. Mm. So yes, she is, as Eric says, speaking truth to power. Um, and Sir Arthur is, um, is corrupt. And in a way, sort of technically, he is the one that sort of set this whole plot spinning with his seduction of Winifred. Mm. And then his manipulation of Winifred and Frank to get together in order to hide his own misdeeds. And so he, in a way, Sir Arthur is the one that instigated yeah. all of this. Uh, so it's um, that, even that's such an, uh, I'm really glad we did that today and that uh, Elizabeth had a chance to, to read that because that's such a great scene. I mean, she, you know, Mother Sawyer is not a good person. She's not a pure person, but boy, she's telling the truth there. So it's just so hard to know what to think of people and how to assess them, what to make of them. But I think that's that's kind of part of it. And and I'm actually really loving that. Yes, and the, the play the playwright isn't letting the audience off the hook in terms of making easy choices about the characters. And also, I love the way that the, uh, the construction of the play, because you're right, uh, Sir Arthur kicked all this off. And now finally, we've got A and B plots uh, coming together in a more uh, cohesive way, or so it seems, um, with this confrontation uh, between him and her. Eric, uh, do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, it just feels so modern. Uh, just like, wow. Um, but also, um, yeah, I was going to say that sort of, it's interesting how Frank's uh, bit problem of, you know, being tra trapped into marriages and... Uh, Cuddy's problem of wanting to be with Catherine are solved in the same action. So it's kind of like they're both resolved in the same, but basically by Frank killing Susan and framing Warbeck and Somerton for murder. Um, it's like two problems solved with the same solution, which is quite interesting if you think yeah. about it. Um, and also just a, a lot of the stuff that the dog says he can't do um, are basically technicalities. Uh, you, it's very much sort of like, you know, uh, arresting someone and who is actually a murderer or something, and then they get away on, off, uh, they get away with it because of technicalities. That's basically what the dog is. He's the accomplice, he's the, or yeah, it just kind of, it's interesting how that's framed. And I think the whole mirror, like reflection parallel, as you know, as we were talking about earlier, is working out quite interestingly. Yeah, yeah that dog. I mean, is... the dog is the mirror of the characters. Yeah, he's a, he's lethally efficient. That dog, isn't he? Um, Dan, do you have any final thoughts? Yes, I have a couple. Um, first of all, um, well, Elizabeth had pointed out, yes, absolutely played by dog, played by an actor here. Although I don't know if that was necessarily the case. In, in another play, in a lost play that we were talking about yesterday. Um, just, the, just uh, uh, it would seem to me that it would seem the, the most efficient way to have this act, uh, this dog being played, a talking dog who's doing, who's tying up people and whatnot would be played by an actor and not by a puppet. Um, I really am enjoying this play. I think the contrast with Dr. Faustus, I think is because of the fact, and this has already been pointed out about um, the real witch, Elizabeth Sawyer, um, 
it, the way that she's described, I guess, in the pamphlets is she, you're not, you don't have any sympathy for her really, um, or at least it's not in the pamphlet for you to have sympathy, whereas in this play, absolutely, I think there is. And I think this makes a classic anti-hero for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always, that's a tried and true um, trope in these kinds of stories. So for that reason, I really, I, th I think it's really well written. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to uh, empathize as well, at least understand Cuddy's story as well for that mm -hmm. same reason. Not so sure about Frank, mm -hmm. but um, the idea, yeah, we. We're, we're kind of not necessarily victims in, in society, you know, we, we were, we're dealt a bad hand or whatever. And yeah, sometimes we'll turn to these kinds of solutions. Mm. Yeah, Lois, uh, do you have any final thoughts? Well, I mean, the Faustus parallel is interesting because uh, in uh, Marlowe and the various people, including this guy Bird, actually, I think, who were involved in writing additions to it, uh, we're not really interested in society at all. I mean, it all happens between Faustus and the devil, and there's no sense that he's been driven into it. In fact, he's a highly successful man who just wants more. Whereas here, uh, I mean, everything is really about the, the role of society in, in pushing these people into what they do. They, they all feel sort of trapped. Um, and I guess um, another thing, since I was reading The Incredibly Saintly Susan, is that uh, uh, you know, I mean, she might be the one character in the play that you'd think was unbelievable, but it struck me that they'd been quite skillful even with her and that so much of what she says unintentionally twists the knife in somebody, you know, because, uh, you know, she doesn't know what's going on. And so she, she just keeps saying things that, that make Frank feel even worse and more guilty. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and then the, the irony of, of the fact that everything he says to make her miserable actually makes her happy that she's dying when she's free from sin and can be and then, of course, she dies asking for his forgiveness, uh, that he should be forgiven, which yeah. might strike everybody as unbelievable. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, uh, it's just part of the, the surprises that the play keeps springing on you. Yeah, it is a surprise because, I mean, especially because when we meet Susan, she's very frank and direct and she's seeing off Warbeck. So we know that this is a, a woman who has spirit and an independent mind. Uh, I suppose you could perhaps just put it down to the fact that she's head over ears in love with him, maybe. I, I, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's a really good uh, point. And it, yeah, it, the, so deft in the way the playwrights uh, construct her character and, 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 and give her these, these things to say that, as you say, twist the knife in even more. Um, no pun intended, terrible pun. Um, Greg, do you have any final thoughts? No, just really interesting, uh, having seen it on stage, to hear it and hear the language even clearer in some ways. No, fab. And Stephen, any final thoughts from you? Um, well, most of it's been said by other people, I suppose. Um, uh, I, I'm Obviously, I'm really interested in the dog, I suppose, as a framing device. You know, you've sort of seen, I've seen productions of Faustus where, you know, stuff is around most of the time I've seen plays where there are fairies all over the place, you know, and seen Johnson's Zanies in, in Volponia, and they're all on stage all the time. And I, re I think that gives so many kind of options for framing. Um, it's one, you know, reading the earlier plays, it's kind of, you know, everything's being said and, and the, the dog scenes are interesting because the dog has almost no lines for great periods, but what is the dog up to? Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose the other point is, well, it, it's been made, but I, I find the, the kind of world of the play fascinating. It's a kind of enchanted world. And so even though, yes, the psychology is sort of very modern, it also, it also seems very unmodern to me. It, it go, I was thinking as we were reading this um, of, of you know, all those 16th century plays where, we, you know, the kind of randomness of people's behavior is attributed to, to Cupid. Yeah, who, yeah. who is quite a sort of uh, puck-ish figure, quite a mischievous figure. Um, and the dog, of course, is also, you know, of that species of vice, which is, which is purely about mischief and, and evil uh, and meddling. So I, I, find, I find this kind of enchanted world uh, where people really kind of don't know what's going on and they're a kind of prey of these forces. I find that a really, really interesting world um, to to have as part of it all the things that people have already been saying about you know the way in which um, you know somebody can be voicing a critique of something 
uh, and yet at the same time, you know, just be uh, just be surrounded by, you know, a, 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 um, as it were, an unfamiliar, familiar world. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Tonally, it reminds me quite a lot. In, in certain scenes, it reminds me quite a lot of the old wives' tale. Uh, but yet, we've then got all this like really quite horrific stuff, uh, and and all these really complex um, themes and ideas being woven into that 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 sort of uh, fairy fairyland um, atmosphere. Right. Well, uh, that is the end of part two of The Witch of Endor. We will pick it up again for the final part tomorrow. Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to all our readers uh, for their insights and their marvellous performances. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow, hopefully, for part three. Bow wow. I'll have it now. <laughs>